So you heard the one about the farmer, right? The farmer who had never been in the big city, never, ever been in the big city, even though he sent some money into the city periodically to be deposited in this thing called the bank. And one day he decided to go in to the big city and, and check out what this bank was, check out what the city was like, and he took his wife and and his son, and being out on the farm, they didn't, they didn't spend a whole lot of time in the gym or fashion mart or anything like that. So they were, they were well fed. And uh, they, they went into town, and uh, the man said, I see this building over here, it's called a bank, I'm going there. And the wife said, I see those shops over there, I'm going to go over there. And so they split up, and the man went in this big building called a bank, and he walked in the lobby, and oh my goodness, it was huge and gorgeous and, and impressive. And he stood there, and, and as he was sitting there in the lobby, this uh, very, very uh, unattractive woman came walking past him through the lobby and she stood in front of these these shiny shiny doors and the, the doors opened and this this very large woman walked in into those doors and those doors closed like this and little dial above the doors with the numbers on it went ding 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 from one to six and stopped and he kept watching and pretty soon the dial went ding 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 from six down to one and these shiny doors opened and and out of the doors, out of this little tiny room behind the doors, walked this gorgeous redhead. Oh my goodness. He grabbed his son. He said, you watch that thing, I'm going to go get your mama and run her through those doors. <laughs> he was looking for a transformation, not necessarily for himself. Each of us has areas in our lives that we'd like to change. We'd like to be transformed into something better. Transformation is often really, really good. I, my law office is in a gorgeous three-story old mansion down in the West Campus area. And it's been transformed from a historic home into a law office and we really enjoyed it. Did you read in the paper this last week? How many of you remember what the spruce goose was? So spruce goose was this giant uh, wooden airplane that Howard Hughes built and swore it would fly. And sure enough, it, it flew for about 10 minutes for about three miles. And he kept in this giant hangar. And I just read over the weekend that, that Google has has bought that hangar and moved its YouTube operation into this old spruce goose hangar, a, a great transformation of an old building. <coughs> Tonight we're going to talk about Saul, a, a transformed life. Her chapter 9 is, is about a transformation, a, a transformed life, the life of Saul of Tarsus. Saul. Saul was born in Washington, D.C., born of a very prominent family. I think it was the Rockefellers. He went to Yale, the best school on the best program, and he had the very best professor at school as his mentor. He made straight A's. He was on the honor roll every year. He, he knew the law backwards and forwards. He was a member of the best political party at that time. He, he was groomed from the day he was born to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court or maybe, maybe President of the State of Israel. He, he had everything going for him. And his life is transformed from what he thought it was going to be to what God intended it for him. Chapter 9 and the transformation of, of Saul is called by some scholars as the most important event in the history of the church since Pentecost. And the episode that we read tonight about the transformation of Saul is mentioned three times in Acts. We'll read it 
two more times. Saul the persecutor is changed to Saul the, the apostle. And we'll look at Saul, a transformed life, and we'll ask, what? We'll look at the features of transformed life, and then we'll ask, so what, as we always do. And we'll talk about the steps toward a transformed life, and then we'll, we'll ask, now what? How do we apply this? What are, the, what are the foundations of a transformed life? We begin in a good place to begin, verse 1 of chapter 9. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, Saul, the, the Darth Vader of the first century, was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for a, an arrest warrant so he could go to Damascus and the 30 or 40 synagogues there and root out any followers of the way and prosecute them, bring them back to Jerusalem. Saul, Saul earnestly believed he was doing the right thing. Saul was zealous for Yahweh. And he felt like he was doing God's work. And that he was ordained by God to root out the blasphemers. He, he thought that maybe with the death of this Jesus that would go away. But he heard reports that, that in fact this, this religious sect was growing. I, I rather suspect he heard about Philip. He might have read chapter 8 of Acts. And, 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 and discovered that, that this guy Philip was going around and, and converting. This guy Peter was going around and transforming lives. And the, that something's going on. And, and, and Saul believed he, he was the one to put a stop to it. As he neared Damascus on his journey, about noon, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, a light more brilliant than the sun. It had to have reminded him of the kind of glory of God. A light flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, and I wonder for just a moment, if Saul had imagined that that voice was going to be like, like the voice of God to Moses on Mount Sinai, I wonder if Saul thought there for a second, yes, God himself is going to say, Saul, way to go. Good job. Keep up the good work. And Saul might, just might, been a little excited there for a second. And he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? In an instant, the Holy Spirit of God gave Saul a recognition that it was Jesus of Nazareth, the prophesied Messiah, the predicted Savior, the Son of God, who was speaking to him. Can you imagine what he must have felt? Oh my God! You mean the one we killed is alive? You mean the one that we called a blasphemer and a liar is telling the truth? Do you mean to tell me that I'm wrong? Dead wrong? That everything I've been doing for the last few weeks and months is the exact opposite of what I should be doing. <clears throat> and the voice says, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Saul so got up 
with his eyes. And for three days he was blind. You read, you read that little verse there, you know, verse 9. For three days he was blind. Imagine with me for a second what was going through Saul's mind, blind, helpless. The realization that the king of the universe, Yahweh God, his Lord was also Jesus. What's going to happen? Where's this going? For three days, he was like Jonah in the belly of the whale. For three days, he was in dark agony. And the first step toward a transformed life is recognition. Recognizing who Jesus is. Acknowledging who Jesus is, admitting who Jesus is, confessing who Jesus is, and believing in your heart that He is the Christ. And in chapter 22, verse 10, we read the next thing that He says after, Who are you? Lord, a recognition that Jesus is the Lord after he recognizes that and the Holy Spirit puts it on his heart that that's the truth he asks what shall I do Lord and that's the second step of a transformed life for it's true repentance it's not only recognizing who Jesus is but it's recognizing who you are a sinner in need of a savior Surrender is what it is. Total surrender. Oswald Chambers said Paul at that moment gave up his right to himself. And then we read the most interesting parts of our story. And they, they get in Damascus and meanwhile, back in back on State Street, the Lord comes to his disciple Ananias and says, go to the house on State Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Vision, he's seen you come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. And had the snipes, he got to say, have I been pumped? Are you kidding me? Lord, have you read the news? Do you know about this guy? We got the right guy here. Did this salt right? You got the, there are plenty of people named Ananias. You talk to somebody else, Lord. The Lord gently slaps him in the face. He says, Ananias, this is not a debate. We're not having a discussion here, buddy. Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. This is my God, Ananias, and I want you to go to him. And I can just see Ananias. You know, he shakes his head, checks to make sure his will is in the top drawer of the desk. Pats his kids on the head, kisses his wife one long last goodbye, puts on a helmet, puts on a stone-proof vest, <laughs> wonders if he's got disability insurance. My life insurance paid up to date, honey, you yeah, need to call the agent. That's what I would have done. And I couldn't do that. He shows us the third response of a transformed life. And that's a response. And the response there is trust. Ananias trusts in the word of God, puts his, hand, his life in God's hands, and he does what God calls him to do. That's what faith is. 
F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I trust him. It's the acrostic for faith. In absolute trust, Ananias responds to God's call. And the fourth step of a transformed life is reception. That's receiving the Holy Spirit. As Dale told us earlier, Paul literally can see again. He sees the light, the light of Jesus Christ, the light of life, the very light of life. And, and he receives the Holy Spirit and is baptized and, and is so thankful that the first words out of Ananias' mouth are brother. He knows that he has received the Holy Spirit for true conversion is due to a divine intervention. It is from God. It's a gift by grace. In the fifth step of a transformed life, that, or the fifth feature that we see is, is relationship for, for immediately. Saul seeks fellowship with the saints. That's, that's a feature of a transformed life. It's to be with other saints. And the sixth feature of a transformed life is reaching out for immediately, Paul began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God and proving that, that Jesus is the Christ. It's reaching out to others and sharing the good news. God, let me tell you, I've been wrong. Let me tell you the good news. Do you think, how can this be? Saul is a murderer. Surely Saul has committed the unforgivable sin. He's murdered Christians seemingly in the name of God. He's resisted the Holy Spirit. He's resisted the word of Jesus. Surely that's the unforgivable sin. And our lesson says, no, it's not. If Saul can be saved, anybody can be saved. Everybody can be saved. He accepts and receives the Holy Spirit, accepts Jesus as his Savior. He has not committed an unforgivable sin, whatever that may be. He's saved. Saul doesn't wallow in sorrow over his sin. He doesn't spend time regretting his wrongs. He isn't paralyzed by the past. He hadn't even read Romans yet. <laughs> in his mind, he's already thinking, for there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And he goes out to tell others. Then he writes the letter. Gosh, there's so much in this. <laughs> I've got a couple hours. You guys got a couple hours. <laughs> so what? You want to have a transformed life? <laughs> I love the way Ananias puts it. Ananias is talking to Paul. I mean, St. Paul, right? I mean, he says, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, call on his name. Don't be laying around the house, Saul. You can call by God. Get up. That's the first step to have a transformed life is get up. Get off the fence. You want a transformed life? Then, then seek a transformed life. The longer I stay fat, the fatter I get. The longer I wallow in my sin, the more sin I commit. Get up. Decide to be transformed. And then be forgiven. In order to do that, you've got to repent. Get in the shower. Wash that dirty clothes. Take them off. Get clean. Wash those sins away, says Ananias to Saul. And, and accept the fact that you're forgiven.
and then be baptized, be changed. Turn 180 degrees, and you can't do it yourself. You've got to do it by the Holy Spirit. Be baptized here is to be baptized, changed, transformed by the Holy Spirit. To be transformed, you've got to change direction. And then you call on His name. What shall I do, Lord? And be willing to do what the Lord calls you to do. John Newton, mid-1700s, was known as the great blasphemer. He worked on a number of slave ships. He was so bad that they made him a slave because they couldn't control him. One night, on that slave ship called the Grey Heron in 1747, a storm came up and he knew he was dying. And he called out to the Lord. My mother told you, told me about you. I want to be transformed. I want to be changed. And miraculously, by God's grace, John Newton made it through that storm went on to lead Bible studies, went on to be a pastor in England, went on to write a song in which he said, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind like Saul, but now I see. We've seen contrasting characters. Peter, Ananias and Sapphira, Simon, Saul. Transformed people, not transformed people. How can you tell? How can you know? Only the Lord knows for sure. Only the Lord, Lord knows for sure about others, but you can know for sure about yourself. How? Luke tells us through the life of Paul. Two foundations of a transformed life. Sovereignty and surrender. By sovereignty I mean asking the question, who are you? Lord, in answering it, as Peter does, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Answering it as Paul does, preaching that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Secondly, surrender. What shall I do, Lord? Total surrender of your life to His. Accepting that He is not only the Christ, but that He is the Son of God. That He is not only Savior, but He is Lord. And all else flows from those two foundations. Acknowledging that I am a sinner. Believing in my heart that Jesus is my one and only Savior getting off the throne of my life and asking Jesus to take his rightful place as Lord over every aspect of my life. I have to ask myself that daily, do I really want to be transformed? Do I really want to be different? Do I really want to keep heading in the right direction? And every day, the Lord says, let's go back to the foundations. <coughs> you need a Savior, and He is Christ the Lord. You need a Lord, and He is the Son of God. 
And as I accept those truths, I come to understand every day of my life that Jesus changes lives. He changed Peter's life. He changed Saul's life. He changed my life. And he encourages me to tell everyone that I know and love. He is your Savior. And he is your Lord. For Jesus will change your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for setting it out to us so concisely, so beautifully. Thank you for giving us an illustration, no, an example of a real person. A real person that was once headed in the wrong direction. By your grace, by your mercy, and by your spirit, acknowledged that he was heading in the wrong direction and looked to you to change his life. Father, please keep it up by your spirit. Please keep changing me that I might out of gratitude tell others that Jesus changes lives. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.